Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. A couple of news items off the top. We are going to be on tour in October. Columbus, Ohio, October 6th through the 9th at CXC. By the way, leave some comments below if there's something you'd like to see us pull out of the Billy Ireland for a possible episode or, or a closer look. Uh, we'll be at Baltimore Comic Con the end of the month, October 20th to the 30th, the, uh, the the home show where Cartoonist Kayfabe was conceived. And you can catch me in Jacksonville at their public library for a comic and zine fest on Saturday, October 22nd. October's qu- coming up quick. So the 2022 official Cartoonist Kayfabe-tober drawing prompts. We are putting this list together. We will be sharing this on our social media and we will be sharing your drawings on social media. Uh, tag us if you follow this list whenever this begins in October. Should be a lot of fun seeing some of those prompts come to life. And we are also working cartoonists. And the way we get paid is you buy our books. So Red Room Trigger Warnings, the second season of Ed Piscor's Splatterpunk masterpiece Red Room, available in stores in September. You can see... It's a real book, man. Here it is. Yeah. Collecting that second season looks great on your shelf next to the Antisocial Network. Pick that up wherever you find books. Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live, back in print from Image Comics. All of my Street Angel comics from Image, plus a few that weren't published by Image, are in this collection. Perfect place to start with my comics. And Hulk Grand Design, Monster Madness, two oversized issue telling the history of the Incredible Hulk. Available now wherever comic books are sold. And available for pre-order as an oversized treasury edition that'll be out in December. So pick that up wherever you get comics. And now, Bat Manga. Do you remember this coming out, Ed? This oh, is a yeah. 2008, I believe, publication. Chip Kid's name is uh, kind of the, the biggest name on this cover. Longtime Batman fan, collector, very well known for that. And basically, as he's collecting kind of like uh, a lot of the Japanese toys and Batman paraphernalia that comes out, he comes across word that Jiro Kuwata was the manga artist that did a Batman manga. And according to Chip Kidd, this is kind of news to him in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. I think David Mazzucchelli had told him rumors about this, but he had never really seen the manga. And he starts to uh, go on a rabbit hunt trying to find this stuff. And sure enough, there's a big run of it. I believe there are two volumes of Bat Manga that have been published um, since then, collecting all of this stuff. But it puts me in mind of something like a Fletcher Hanks comic, where you hear about this thing, you kind of maybe dream about it if you're a Batman collector and uh once he starts getting it you know you find more and more of it the interesting thing is once he gets a few of these bat manga pieces together sends a proposal to paul levitz at dc comics paul's like what is this stuff and signs off quickly like yes please do this and so chip kid puts together this book showcasing the batman comics that were created off of the popularity of the 60s batman tv show and these things were not direct adaptations of you know, American Batman scripts. This was a mangaka given some source material and uh, set free to adapt this stuff. So uh, Chip Kid is designing this book and part of the appeal, part of the reason I wanted to show it off was to kind of show off all of this ephemera that he puts together in addition to the comics, which we will see in here also. But some of this extra stuff is so cool. We bumped into uh, Chip Kid at the Billy Ireland last time we were out there probably. And it was random. Like, we were out there doing our own thing, and just Chip Kid pops in. The people we were with, everybody's like, that's Chip Kid. Oh, I'm too scared <laughs> to go up to him. I went right up to the dude. I'm like, yo, Chip, what are you trying to look at here, man? 250,000 pieces of artwork in this joint? Like, what are you looking at? And he goes, I don't know, random Batman stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So he's not playing. You know, like, he's into this thing. Uh, it's so cool seeing, like, this, this cartoonist is a creator of Eight Man who's kind of looks like a superhero-ish right. kind of character off the bat. And it's really cool to see a mangaka filter superhero comics through that idiom. Absolutely. There's some really nice production notes on here, too. And uh, we'll get into those as we're looking at the comics, some of those notes on it. And the introduction is basically what I said. It it's, gives us some background on how Chip Kid found this material and... You know, tracking it down from this is an idea that exists to I need to have some of these, I need to see some of this bat manga. And so that's what you get a little bit more context here from uh, 2008, including an interview here with the mangaka, uh, Jiro Kuwata, in the beginning. Um, There's not a lot of revealing info here, but it's pretty cool that he was able to track down the original cartoonist and actually get him to 
talk a little bit about this experience and how he worked on the series, which, like I said, they gave him a pile of comics and then he kind of like took those comics and thought what will work in Japanese comics. Jimmy, keep filibustering, man. I'm going to go grab a couple of things. Tezuka being a big influence on Kawada, by the way, it comes up um, in the intro as well as in that interview. And some of this extra material is, is again, part of what makes this book so special. I think some of the collections, the other Bat Manga collections, are actually uh, smaller, more manga-like digest sizes and more straightforward what we think of as like manga comics, you know, one color reproductions, cleaned up line art, perfect. It's exactly what I'm talking about, Ed. It's like you read my mind and you can see, you know, black and white, a much more standard approach to manga reproduction is what you're seeing with these. And also a lot more reprinted. One of the kind of weird parts of this original Bat Manga printing is there'll be like part two of a storyline or part three, you know, and a lot of incomplete pieces, which again reminds me kind of of the Fletcher Hanks comics where it was like, this is what we could find. So this is what we're printing. And then more surfaces as uh, interest in this increases, which I often think is something that happens with cartoonist kayfabe, where if I'm looking for a book, we maybe won't cover it till we track it down. Yeah, which by the way, dude, this is an Ollie's purchase oh, nice. that, that was remaindered three dollars for this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of wild how I'm that I'm sorry works. I knocked you off your hustle. Well, well no, the other thing is, like, whenever I finally can't find a book, sometimes we'll cover it because it shakes out more copies. Yeah. So I do think <laughs> these conversations are useful in that regard. It might make a few things disappear, kayfabe effect, but it also, uh, if the thing's obscure enough, may produce a few more. So one of the nice process pieces that he does is translate some of the uh, the Japanese on these sidebars. And a lot of the comics even have that stuff in the pages. There's so many of these, like just beautiful images like you're talking about at Nakano Broadway yeah. of like these movie poster style images. Gorgeous images, and, right? And just so clear that they have access to the Burt Ward at right. West TV show and stuff because like you, you just have never seen an image like this in the American comics at all. It's amazing to see like that Batman TV show version of Batman, but shooting missiles yeah. <laughs> out of his bike. It's, it's not far from those like Guyanan movie posters. Yeah, exactly pretty intense stuff too you know like like the batman stuff underwater way of virgil finley or super something. awesome looking but here we go like actually getting into some of the manga now and you know jeff spears is the photographer who works with chip kid on a lot of this stuff clearly the aesthetic that kid likes is is actually photographing these pages yeah. as opposed to say scanning it so you get the very pulpy uh you know low quality paper that these were originally printed on but here's where your translations run. So you can see like there's some Japanese running in the gutters and stuff in the margins. And that's what he's translating. And it's weird stuff like star trivia. Um, you know, some of it not at all related to Batman. He also talks about um, replacing the lettering and rather than doing like a hand lettering, which he usually prefers, setting it in this type. And I see a lot of manga that's set in this kind of, um, you know, like a typeface that is there's no pretend that this is hand lettering or trying to match a hand lettering like this is just a, a straight up sans serif font oh yeah yeah in sure. this case gotham so very appropriate <laughs> and his first storyline features clayface so it's kind of cool because some of these do not feature uh batman's rogues gallery they create fucking way cooler villains but it's man. neat to see the ones that do and also like seeing how scrappy these what they were shooting from is like these are beat up pages just desiccated like uh, you know, they might; those same pages might not be here anymore. And you can see, like, this stuff feels on model, like the Batmobile totally out of the 60s TV show. Jerry Lawler owns that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> uh, I was reading some of these this week, which was pretty fun, and it made me think about just the different ways we build pages. Yeah. Because this stuff is... is it's very simple in that there's not a lot of background distraction. You know, whatever's happening, like, you can read through these sequences pretty quickly. Yeah, 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 total, you know, it's the manga idiom, like I said, dude, and it's it's about seeing a story unfold rather than just the minutia of their day-to-day. -day. This is, uh, again, the Clayface story. I think there's a couple of parts in here of this story, and in this, Clayface is able to transform into other shapes. You know, he's a shapeshifter character. So a little bit different, I think, than the, uh, the, the traditional clay face that we see in Batman comics here. But it's pretty fun whenever he's just the glob of clay and yeah. he's like talking and stuff. <laughs> yeah, every now and then you get that real money shot. This is that kind of manga, too, that like in some ways with another assistant or two. Yeah, I could, I could see you turning one of these out every two weeks 
like an episode every two weeks. Yeah, and I don't, I find no fault with that. You know, like it's, um, these are kind of silly comics. So yeah. how much do you really need to spend more time on a background for something like this? Like they're entertaining. There's some really cool visuals as we go through. You'll see, you know, like even Clayface turning into a dinosaur monster. Yeah. Kind of fun. Um, but there's some deluxe stuff that we'll get to of like two page spreads that look good. So I don't think anything is sacrificed in this style of of drawing. No. You know, from a from a reading entertainment standpoint, I don't think we're uh, we're missing out on anything. But it, it does contribute to sort of the fetishization of print in, yeah. in my world. You know, like that's part of what attracted me to this edition versus, say, the cleaner black and white kind of bat manga editions that are also available. I like seeing this kind of stuff. You know, I Absolutely. like seeing some of the different approaches to printing. And even within like the same story, you'll see this stuff where it looks like there's a second color or something added. It's very peculiar because it's not consistent. You know, I mean, even the page before doesn't have that treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So, maybe, maybe that's, you know, signatures. Yeah. It's got to be, I assume it's got to be something like that, but you can also see like how much the color of the ink fluctuates from story to story, issue to issue. It makes for a beautiful book, I think. And I think that's part of what I like about a lot of the, the way Chip Kid shoots these comics. And I it must be part of the aesthetic that he enjoys because there are different ways to do this. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, he's a master of design. Like he's not, not doing this unless it's the way he wants it to look. Yeah, for sure. I feel like this is like one of the... Love seeing like when you get color, yeah, you know, like is, your covers or chapter breaks. This is one of the early books that really magnified comics like this and, and like use this approach. Yeah, and it, it fits into that like outsider... It, these it's, are, it's these new, are it's, good Batman comics. There's, there's nothing wrong with the Batman characterization in these, but so atypical of a 2008 Batman. Oh, absolutely. Like the, the Chip Kid books, it's like... New Yorkers appreciation of comics or something like you could just you know this is like sitting on the coffee table of like bougie Manhattanites or something yeah it feels like an art book like, yeah. like the, an oh, element yeah, that totally. he's bringing to you know on top of these comics and creating this context it's certainly been an influence in the way I think about this stuff because it's presentation oh, you know totally. this, this could just be black and white very cleaned up line art even that belly band on the back cover <laughs> like, like take a look dude it's it's Batman on the actual cover or hold up where was it is it on the front uh, but, but there's but there's Robin is on the belly band you know the the, the thing that's so oh, see, fun about I this I said look in the back and you looked at the front people always uh I feel like this is the thing that he would get criticized for because he was doing Buddha, the Buddha Tezuka oh, yeah. books at the time. They had the belly bands. I heard so many retailers compare, complain about these belly bands, and you can see why. Yeah. Like, there's no way to keep them in mint condition. <laughs> they look really cool, but they're terrible for the poor retailers who have to unpack boxes that are being shipped with this stuff. Yeah. But man, the two color stuff looks really good. And this is Lord Death Man, which I don't believe is part of the Batman's gallery. One of the raddest, man. But very Papa cool. Shango. Yeah, like, look at that. And whenever he shows up, like, we go from these kind of pulpy one-color pages to... That's that a two-color page. Yeah. What's the order here? It's so weird. You know, like, this says page seven, page eight. So, very bizarre, like, how these are laid out. But, man, that looks great. It's striking designs for these characters. Archie Goodwin. Oh. <laughs> Somehow, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> But, you know, even here it's going, like, page 11 to 12 where we're getting a second color added. Pretty weird. Yeah. I wonder if that second color was always an option and it just was based on does the cartoonist have time to add it? Because, like, we're getting it consistently in this particular chapter. It, it, can, it can be the magazine that, that it appeared in, too, had that ability. But it's a great-looking Batman. I really like the art. And in that interview in the beginning... Um, the, the mangaka was talking about originally he was going to try to draw it like an American Batman comic yeah. and realized like deadlines just wouldn't allow that. That's the thing I was but really trying to But it's not that far off. It looks like, uh, it looks kind of like the thirties bat, you know, the 1930 Batman. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know. Like, like what are we doing? That's so much more labor intensive. Cause like their, their stuff looks tough. That doesn't look easy to do. It doesn't. It does make you wonder, like, can you do 80 pages of this in a month? And if you could do something that approximates this, why aren't we? Exactly. Because I, I don't think you're losing that much. Mm -mm. Like, like doing, I don't know, intense, time-consuming perspective or elaborate backgrounds, are you really getting much from a story standpoint? Look Sometimes this, this Batman gets a little bit out of character. Frederick Wortham was right. 
<laughs> yeah, they went on vacation, but it didn't work because they're listening to the radio, and it turns out the guy's still alive. Military trivia running down the uh, the gutters. Oh, yeah. Like, is it is it Japanese military trivia? Yeah, of course. Because I saw some uh, tin toys and stuff in the front pieces there. And uh, when I was around Nakano Broadway Mall, man, like, digging up toys and things, uh, dudes were showing me that there was, like, this period of toy where it had stamped into it uh, made in occupied Japan. Almost like as, like, an insult, right. like, listen, we won the war, you, and you were bad boys, so you have to stamp that. You have to, like, humble yourself and stamp this on all of your tin toys for, this like, a couple years. Lord Death keeps dying and coming back <laughs> and every time they think they kill him he comes back you know it's a pretty fun character i'm surprised that's not something that dc would have uh been like yeah let's bring that in you know how this is like so off model with other colors and stuff the ben cooper costumes would allow for weirdness yeah like that this feels made up the very intro story about this is the chip kid bought this japanese Batmobile that had like a Batman like a weird Batman figure in it and as soon as he won the auction which he says was competitive he gets the message from the from the other guy who turned him on to the Batmanga and was like that's a bootleg toy <laughs> somebody just jammed that figure in that toy it's a great cover it's yeah. a striking image almost worth you know like that feels almost like a DC cover and it if, would make sense if he's looking at DC comics as a starting point yeah. that he might steal some of the design kind of uh, elements and compositions it feels, uh, feels straight from the Golden Age. Yes. Yeah, totally. It's a good fit. There's so much, like, um, you know, the Hulk manga has not been translated. Right. And I swear that has legs. Like, think of all the ups and downs that the Hulk's experienced, because it was done in the early 70s before even the TV show. Oh, wow. So, at some point, like, isn't Hulk popular enough that you'd maybe have, you know, be able to sell that book? Yeah, and of course, there's the Ryuichi Ikigami Spider-Man comics. We looked at some of that on, on the channel, and, and that did get some licensed Mar Marvel publishing. This stuff was also very informative to me whenever I'm doing, like, aphrodisiac or any kind of retro color. Did you scan some of this? Whenever you see that. I didn't have this then, but I, I had looked at it. But you see, like, the, the beat up, like, the texture of the paper coming through the ink, and it was like, oh, yeah, how do you do that? Well, let me ask you this, Jimmy, because I remember you, you did some, some work for some sort of French fashion alcohol, so, like, some weird thing, like, and it has a manga page. Like, what did you use for that? Um... Just a random manga and scanned it in? or I, w I would do my own stuff. Like, I'd scan in uh, newsprint or something that had a texture, and I would extract texture from different samples that I would scan. So, like, I would look at this kind of thing, yeah. and then it'd be like, how do I create noise on the page yeah. or uneven ink on the page? So I was building most of that stuff just through layers um, rather than, like, you know, scan this and then get a big solid piece of ink that has the texture already in it. Although that said, I was also scanning treasury editions right. and pulling out like if there was a big solid black area because the newsprint uh, American comics would have the same effect. Look, yeah. this, is, this is one of those pieces that I wanted to show off. They're surrounded by bad guys. So the deal is drive in a, take the wheel Robin, uh, drive in circles creating a centrifugal force. <laughs> and so Batman's spinning around like knocking these guys out and you get a two page spread of that. That's a badass illustration. Yeah. It's really cool looking. I feel like that's that guy really, uh, I don't know, man, either incorporating some stuff from American comics or just being very inventive. And you got to have the onomatopoeia. Like, it's never been at home more than in a bat manga. Yes. Yeah. Kid, kid talks about that in the beginning, too, how they didn't change any of the sound effects, even though, like, that might have made perfect sense to have your pals and smashes <laughs> yeah. and stuff like the TV show. I mean, it's a, it's a Japanese comic, so, like, keep the Japanese stuff. Look at that. This all has to be Japanese Batman stuff, right? I mean, look at the characters. Like, of course. I wonder how much of this is Chip Kid's collection and how much it is the uh, the other guy who contacted him after the eBay uh, <laughs> auction and was like, hey, let's track these down. Wow, this is like a barefoot gen approach to the sweltering summer heat. Isn't that a beautiful page? Even like the reflections in the pool, I feel like, are just stunning. <laughs> this is so awesome. And this is our idea of like Wayne Manor. You know what's funny? If I just showed you that and said, hey, check out this Chris Ware comic. Absolutely. That's a Chris Ware drawing. Absolutely. The buildings. Yeah, so pristi pristine. It's weird that that kind of common language exists. You know, this is a guy in Japan in the 60s, Chris Ware, a guy in Chicago in the 90s, and yet they're able to, like, pretty much speak the same visual language on this stuff. Really good helicopter designs. But then to go from, like, this page to this, 
same, presumably the same publication that he's getting these pictures out of. <laughs> that could almost be your Riddler. Yeah, it's Riddler for the 90s, man. I wish they that the uh, the inks varied a little bit more than just like the purples and blues. Sure, yeah. This this is nearly the Tatsumi approach to cartooning, like those those uh, black winter or yes. black summer, whatever the fuck, like that kind of energy, rental manga speed. Yeah, the uh, the cartoonist, you know, like he talks about that stuff. Like he was coming up then, you know, he would have yeah. been like when Tezuka shows up. Like I think he may have already started professionally at that time. So. Definitely an influence, but also maybe a peer of his. Published whenever he was in school still. Like, he was making his own comics in middle school and showing them off to, like, his classmates and found out that somebody had gone to a publisher like that, you know, like a kid, and the publisher gave him some tips on how to get better. So he's like, I'll take my stuff there and I'll get better. And uh, the publisher bought his stuff on on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) So he becomes a pro. (laughs) That's amazing. Look at these. The motion stuff works really well with the superhero comics. Does it surprise you when you see something like this that like superheroes weren't a big genre? It does, especially with Toku Sensei and like all the Power Rangers, like all that kind of stuff. Because it seems like the language is all there. Like it, it lends itself very well to this kind of dynamic storytelling. That's really great. Good motion. So pretty awesome. And I remember this book being popular at the time. Yeah. I bought this used not too long ago. It's at every I library. I looking at a lot of it. You know, go to any good library, and, and this is this is on the shelves. In the intro, Kid talks about, you know, it's like two genres, right? Manga and Batman that are joining forces. It does feel like the formula. If AI was making comics now, <laughs> this feels like that could be a formula that uh, the computer would come up with. And then this kind of stuff I love where, like, imagine this is probably an inch and a half in, in uh, print, but you blow it up to your eight and a half by 11 here, full size. This stuff was really... Uh, just a big influence on me overall for everything for design playing with scale on these different images and i wonder if that's a chapter head inside a book not right. the cover but an, you know like the two two colors that would be inside texture and everything looks the same too it feels like what you would read about in like manga manga when they describe the original phone books and it's like the crappiest pa- wood pulp paper that would just get recycled yeah you feel it there yeah i mean it's Wow. Like this? The amount of texture on that page. It, it's it comes amazing. through. Yeah, it's amazing that any of that stuff survived. It is. It is. And you think about, like, how much of this stuff is lost. You know, I was thinking about newspaper clippings and things that are just gone. You yeah. Know, like, like history of, uh, if you really need a newspaper, you may be out of luck on finding, the, finding an actual copy of it. Which is sad. I've been going down ra- old wrestling rabbit holes, and it's like some of those wrestlers in the early 20th century... Might have even made front page news some of the big matches. Good luck finding one of those newspapers for a piece of reference. Uncle Jim Cornette has it, though. That's right. I'm going to have to start uh, calling on him for some, some reference materials. And this just never ends. That's why I think, like, it's got to be more than Chip Kid's collection, right? You know, it's so great, too, that he's breaking up storylines with this extra imagery. Because what happens when you when you have, like, an artist edition, you have 200 pages of sort of orig- the same stuff. It, it, there's, like, there's, like, a cruise control that happens and cutting these at the chapter and showing off a little bit of extra stuff some photographs of toys whatever it knocks you out of that page turn yeah for a book designer this is a really good book for that reason um this story professor gorilla it feels like this is golden age dc right full mort weisinger julie schwartz (laughs) era shit i was gonna say julie schwartz would approve (laughs) even in a costume that's amazing Yeah, yeah that's that's sick. It's basically something happened to this gorilla that he got the professor's brain. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, you know, Atlas Marvel. I like that uh, the idea is you have to adapt some of those DC Batman stories so that they make sense kind of to your like- Japanese audience. And this is this is what the adaptation looks like. This but, is right out of a DC comic. Yeah, but you don't ever see the gorilla. No, it's true. Although maybe in part three. This one started with part two. So we might see him unmasked. I mean... If you're going to call him Gorilla. Look at how much range, though. Like, totally purple ink, and then your two color, like your brown and gray and, and black, orange and black ink. Yeah. It's just bizarre. Like, if this is all from the same issue that he's photographing, the range and, like, the quality of printing, you know? Like, to go from this to this and possibly the same issue. It's funny. Where I'm sitting, I see a face right there. <laughs> 
And also elements like this do feel right out of the TV show. So I don't know what kind of access they had to that. It's but true, I mean, true. this is the building style of that TV show opening animation we, credits. Yeah, when we saw several like rappelling or climbing up the side of buildings on, on the rope. Yeah, it, it fits perfectly within like most of the Batman aesthetic I experienced up until probably Tim Burton's movie. Sure. And then at that point, it's like all bets are off and just everything everything goes. But so much of this stuff feels like classic comic tropes. So And, and you know, we're getting into that oh, space. We do get to see the grill on yeah, mask. Yeah, it is, dude. The reveal. Uh, straight up Donkey Kong looking motherfucker, man. But uh, Monkey's I, big everywhere, right? Japan and the U.S.? Like, I wonder, sometimes this work looks more raw, like more, like earlier, but it's later in the book. So I don't know that these are in any kind of chronological order. Yeah, I don't remember reading anything about that. And because they're in, like part three and just randomly kind of put in here, you could be 100% correct on that. But these are like references to some of the TV characters. Oh, you, know, yeah, you can see likeness Frank references. Gorshin. Yeah. This is kind of neat. You have like your your doctored up cover and then like the advertisement line art version That's of it. That's fun. Dude, elongated man. So it's like this is detective comics. But why you got red teeth? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost inked silver agey. Yeah, it is. Kind of fun, fun to see, uh, you know, a manga could doing that kind of inking style. Like even the legs and stuff, that shadow is totally a thing I learned early on. It's no mistake the red teeth. What the fuck, man? You can't do it two times. Yeah, you think that's not teeth. It's just an open mouth, right? It's got to be... I mean, if you're doing teeth, you're not going to do red. Maybe he's got a mouthpiece. Like a pugilist. Look, look, they both have it. Weird. <laughs> you know what? It's textured. It almost looks like some little kid colored it. That's a great illustration. Oh, that's sick as hell, yeah. Wow. Funny, no idea what, what this would have would have come out of. Dude, we got a name. M. Roundhill... So that's that's America, you know. Yeah, Round Hill is uh, doesn't sound Japanese. That's pretty great. The man who quit being human. I think this is the last big story in this collection. I think that might be the first in this one. And and it's a guy who becomes like a mutant, ends up getting exposed to radiation, and it's kind of like, well, let's go all the way, and uh, gives Batman a gun, <laughs> and says, you know, if I come out of this and I'm and I'm something's wrong with me destroy me and i think they shoot something to demonstrate what that gun can do they shoot a rock or something and it disintegrates that's a great pose all of these covers or chapter headers work for me yeah yeah so here we're going to see a demonstration of what this gun can do so i love this right here because it's like this is such a hard piece to draw you don't see it much you usually see people with their hand down and like it's totally totally wrong also look at how he's like rigged something up with this rope yeah, yeah. I can't tell you exactly what's going on here, He's but it appears something. there's something that, that that's really uh, seems like it might be rooted in reality. A demonstration of what this gun does, almost entirely vaporized. So, if this guy turns evil, this is uh, what what they want him to do. Such a uh, this is almost Marvel Age of Comics now. We're gonna hit, <laughs> we're gonna blast this dude with some gamma radiation and turn him into an X Man. Numbering the panels. I feel like that's the first time we saw that, unless I just wasn't paying attention. I think you're right, and if this is the first story in that Bat manga reprint, like maybe this is an early uh, working out how to do this in, in early issues, and that's your uh, X Men version of this guy who's giving up being human. Pretty rad. How about that? You could get batarangs. <laughs> Looks great, right? It's weird that it's Robin's head is in his crotch, but otherwise, looks pretty cool. But Robin has that Pat Sajak, Burt Ward hair. <laughs> it's a big hair. The helmet. Wizzy wig head. <laughs> so there's your, your bat manga. And a lot of interesting choices, I think, from a design standpoint. And a lot of interesting chances to, like, take a look at the uh, superhero genre and see how that translates. You know, because this is kind of fresh eyes that are being applied by, a, obviously, a master cartoonist. But looking at the stuff that we take for granted here as being, you know, some of the biggest selling comics in history... What's that, tra like, what are the, boil that down. Yeah. Translate that into manga and see what we end up with. And Sal Ferris, this is the, the third guy. This is the person who kind of brought the bat manga to Chip Kid's attention. And I think 
worked a little bit on probably providing some of the color interstitials that we uh, that we looked at. These are classic villains. I just saw Brian Ballin draw those recently. Yeah, pretty fun stuff. I wonder how big these were. They look like little stamps. I think they're cards. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're little cards. So just before we get out of here, man, that isn't the last Bat Bonga. No. Uh, this is the Silent Mobius guy. Uh, oh, I did, didn't realize that's who. Yeah, did, did a manga. And I, I, this will be an episode. I yeah. Think, I think we should read this. This was sent in by somebody in the cartoonist kayfabe audience, man. So, so shouts to the kayfabers that send us comics because this was never on my radar. Yeah, I think I may have... Um, some of these issues, I think this was done as like a mini series and then maybe the book collection. Uh, pretty cool to see though, you know, like like these different iterations of these characters, very exciting. There was there was one in um, Marvel had done with Wolverine called Snicked, mm -hmm. it was also a manga, could, but doing you know, doing a uh, X Men comic. And the other piece that we just can't ever sleep on is Katsuhiro Otomo in Batman Black and White, first round, did about an eight pager, yeah, and I mean. You know, Tony Wong of Jade Man fame. I didn't know that. Did a Batman. We did an episode on it. I didn't know we, he did a Batman. Yeah, yeah. Did a, uh, did a Batman. So uh, there's an episode of that out there if people want to track back through our archives and check that one out. But there's Bat Manga. That, that's your first iteration and successful enough that a couple volumes have followed since then. And remaindered, man. So you could get them for super cheap. Yeah, I don't know if that means they were super popular. Big print run, maybe. <laughs> That's but not, yeah, they do that's float around. I, so. That's not what all these promote as soon as you walk in the door. <laughs> track, track, track them down. Good to go? I am. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Hulk Grand Design. The oversized treasury collection of my Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness series will be in stores, uh, hopefully in time for Christmas. You can pre-order that now wherever books are bought and sold. Street Angel Deadly Squirrel Live, back in print from Image Comics. Uh, should be in your local shops any day if it's not already there. You can pick that up again wherever you pick up books. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see a lot more of my comics and art. Red Room Trigger Warnings hitting the stands within a couple of weeks of this recording. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. You're getting 60-plus uh, new pages worth of material in the new Red Room Trigger Warnings trade paperback, and it uh, is a great companion to the previous Antisocial Network, TPB, that is already out there, man. Get them both. Uh, you can read new Red Room comics at my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. Have all of the existing Red Room material that hit print, and I'm serializing new stuff up there. Like I said, three bucks for all of that. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel. Jimmy, giving the marching orders, will be on our way. Read more comics.